And, you know, by the time I hit 30, I was like, well, I don't, I hate my life. Mm. I hate my life. But the thing that was harder for me was I hated myself. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sobriety Diaries. I'm your host, Nate Kelly, a recovering alcoholic seven years from my last drink, a recovery mentor and podcast producer. I am so grateful to be bringing you these powerful stories of recovery told by you those who live them. Please share this podcast with anyone who may need it today. And with that, let's open the diary on episode 98 of the Sobriety Diaries. Welcome back to the Sobriety Diaries, friends. We've got a great show today. I'm so excited to get to know more about our guest, best-selling author, global speaker, coach, worldwide facilitator. You're a busy man. Welcome to the show, my friend, Brendan Watt. How are you this morning? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm doing well. Your your accent puts me in a, a, a good mood, so I'm excited. I'm excited to chat this morning. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I live in I live in the U.S. now, and I have so many people say, "Where are you from? Are you from South Africa? Are you from New Zealand? Are you from um, England?" And I'm like, "No, Australia." Like he's, how he's do you Aussie. Not get that? <laughs> so you're the second. Uh, Aussie on on the show this season. I spoke yeah. to Mike Diamond, who is an author. He's actually uh, an interventionist on the show Intervention wow. this season. So check out that episode. You uh, you might feel a, a little bit of home okay. <laughs> with Mike. And that would be an interesting profession, intervention. Yeah, he's he has a reality TV show past, and uh, it kind of fits well you know, with, with the show Intervention, which had a pretty profound impact on my own recovery. So it was a pretty powerful uh, episode wow. that we did. Cool. Yeah. But back to the, back to the, the message at hand uh, this morning, I'm excited because I see some similarities in our story and, uh, you know, sort of this middle-class upbringing and this idea of conforming to things that that perhaps we we didn't feel uh that were us uh so yeah. let's start there let's sort of start with with your upbringing and and perhaps how that laid the sort of groundwork for what was to come yeah and i like that it did lay the groundwork for you know the future with in looking back at it and you know i grew up in australia and in a very lower class kind of situation and but had extreme sensitivity you know like i remember starting school and i'd be the kid that was just had no friends you know isolated myself and basically would just cry all the time and i had no idea why i relate to that so much yeah and i was like what is wrong with me and that was my (laughs) point of view basically that's been my point of view about myself my whole life has been this thing of like what's wrong with me so then it was, you know, trying to fit in. It was doing anything I could to shut down myself so that I could fit in and get friends and, you know, not be bullied. And it didn't really work that well, you know, <laughs> but I tried, <laughs> Yeah. you know, and then leaving school, basically what I was told was all you can do is get a trade. You can be a tradesman, a construction worker. And so I did that. And by the time, basically, you know, through my twenties was heavy drinking, you know, and, and just escape. How do I escape? And, you know, by the time I hit 30, I was like, well, I don't, I hate my life. Mm. I hate my life. But the thing that was harder for me was I hated myself. And that's when, that's when things began to change in my life, but didn't begin to change with the drinking. Wow, you know, I started a, yeah, to get, that's a, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. And so my life started changing, but my drinking didn't. And so throughout my thirties, I started doing different things and I found access consciousness, which is what I facilitate now. And, you know, my life started changing big time. And, you know, and then within a few years I'd started facilitating this stuff and basically just anything could come up that would trigger me and I'd isolate myself and, and the same cycle would start again, Mm -hmm. you know? So it wasn't until a couple of years ago, three, I think three years ago that it really got, it got bad, you know, and I, I recognize I began and I did not want to look at it then, but I get, I began to recognize, well, I've got a problem. Was it a sort of secretive lifestyle? Was it 
drinking in, in secret by yourself or was it a, a big party sort of uh, personality lifestyle? No, the last few years, the last couple of years of my drinking was a lot of secret. You know, when it got really bad was during the lockdown with COVID. Yeah. yeah. But before that, it was more, it was more partying and people would see how much I'd, um, well, not even partying. It was just, you know, out and about and doing things, but people would see how much I drink, but that was maybe 30% of it. You know, the rest would be behind the scenes in not knowing how much I could actually expose. And the thing in looking back at it is I thought nobody had any clue. And it's interesting when you talk to people and they're like, dude, I could see this for, <laughs> right. for years that you, that something was wrong. Something was up with it. That's interesting because the, the sort of secretness about it or yeah. the secrets can create an entirely different problem, right? It's almost this different lifestyle that we lead or this persona that we put on. I think secrets can lead to, to more destruction. Oh, totally. And it's like the secrets you keep, you've got to keep building the lies in order to maintain them. And that was the thing that a whole life had turned into this lie of me to myself. And I didn't realize until my journey with sobriety, I didn't, I couldn't even see it. You know, I couldn't even see the lies that I was telling myself because I'd got gotten that good at telling them that it just became part of who I thought I was. How did access consciousness sort of start you on that that path or how does it play in, I guess, to the different life that you lead now? Well, so when I found it uh, 13 years ago, I found this ad in the paper and I was in Australia and I was basically just miserable. You know, I was sharing a bedroom with my four-year-old son at my mother's house. I just left that relationship and I was pretty much at rock bottom. I was towards the end. I just wanted to give up. And I found this little ad in the newspaper saying all of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory. And I was like, what? Um, <laughs> how? <laughs> Tell me how. Like, how? Tell me how. <laughs> you know, and I called this girl and she said, I do this thing called the access bars, which is millions of people around the world know about this. Now it's, it's basically a, um, a process with access, access consciousness about kind of like deleting your computer bank, clearing beliefs and considerations and things like that. So she's like, Hey, do you want to come and have a session? At worst case, it'll be like a good massage. At best yeah. case, your whole life will change. <laughs> you know. So I went and saw this girl and she she started this process and she said, Hey, can I ask you some questions? And she started to talk to me and I just broke. I I sobbed for an hour and a half through this session. And after it, I got up and I was like, oh, it was like all the walls began to crumble down around me. Everything that I'd built up to, to keep myself out of the world, to keep myself separate began to fade. And then, you know, I just kept, I kept going and I kept finding these different tools and I kept searching for something different. My life started just, it just started changing. So you delete your sort of data bank, you start to develop and take action with these new sort of beliefs. I don't know if beliefs is the right word, but we have to start with the, the internal, right? Before it's external and accepting and yeah. loving ourselves. Is that a concept yeah, um, definitely. through the session? And yeah. And that, that became, and it's still one of the things I look at now is if I, any judgment that I have of myself is I'm destroying myself with it. You know, I can't receive anything that doesn't match it. So one of the big beginning elements with access is to get you into question rather than, well, this is the way it is. It's okay. So what else is possible with this or how does it get any better than this? And as you begin to question, you begin to actually open yourself up to receiving again. And that's what I'd done. And this was where, this was where I just couldn't find me at all was I, I locked myself out of receiving basically anything. You know, I had that much judgment of myself that receiving was like, what, like, what is receiving, you know? And I'm, and basically that's the other thing with these access bars is it's about teaching you beginning to teach you how to receive because for most of us, we live in a world of give and take, you know, it's, I'll give you this, then you'll give me that. And it's all a transactional reality. It's not about actual contribution. 
that was the thing it, it you know i began to open up to to that six-year-old kid again you know who went to school and was crying all the time hmm. began to open up to that sensitivity to the universe around me but now i began to have the tools one of the first tools I got, which was very helpful, <laughs> was one of the things that we talk about is 98% of your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions don't belong to you. You're actually aware of them. Right. And I went, what? <laughs> you know, so I was like, you mean I'm not as messed up as I think <laughs> I am? And I realized as soon as I started using that tool, which was all you do is ask when something comes up, you know, and it makes you heavy, who does it belong to? And if it lightens up at all, you just return it to sender. And I was like, wow. And I started doing this and I started realizing that all of these different things that I'd made relevant and I'd bought as real and true for me were just awareness of the world around me. That is, that's a great point. And I think, it, you know, in some cases it's, it can be easier said than, than done, but there is this element about our past as well and and how much power we give our past over oh, totally. over our present and our yeah. future and uh how we perceive our our past selves yeah. do you relate to that totally and for a lot of us we use our past as the way we reference anything to create our future mm. but it doesn't once again it doesn't put you in question of all right what else what's truly possible for me that i've never asked for it's more, well, what have I done before? And how was I treated in the past? And that's going to dictate how I'm treated in the future and all of this stuff. But a couple of months later, I got to a, a seminar with the founder of Access, Gary Douglas, who is just a brilliant man. You know, just, I cannot speak highly enough of him. And one of the things he said, which just lit my world up, he said, your life is the sum total of every choice you've ever made. And I went, what? Because for me, my point of view about my life at that point was, you know, I didn't have any money because I grew up poor. I couldn't create a relationship because all I'd seen was abuse. I hated myself because everyone I grew up with hated themselves. You know, it was all about being the victim and nothing was about choice. So when he said that, I went, wow. So if I've chosen this, if I've made the choices to get me here, I wonder what else I could choose. Mm. That was another part that began to open it up because now with that point of view about myself, I started to recognize, well, maybe I've got some power to actually create my life also. So as you develop or realize that power, in some cases, you know, as as parents, let's say you you now okay. have the power to instill that onto another human being, and that creates a, an entire level of responsibility. How yeah. does how, how did you uh, sort of come to terms with that? I know that that you have the book, the uh, an anonymous guide to parenting. How does all of that sort of come to play in? Uh, this enormous responsibility of, of raising children. Yeah. And can I just say that's one of the toughest jobs on the planet? Oh, I can't yeah. imagine. It's, it just is. And especially once again, for those of us who, who, you know, you're kind of a misfit of the world, you know, you're different. You're probably one of those people that spends a lot of time in self judgment. So for you parenting, it's this thing of, you can never get it right. You know, it's just yeah. constant wrongness. So for me, what I did was, you know, as I began to use these tools and develop more trust with myself, I'd ask my son questions, you know, I'd be like, uh, rather than don't choose that, which would mean he wouldn't get any awareness. He would only get what I was willing to, um, he would only get my point of view. So I'd say, okay, so what's that choice going to create? Or what did that choice create? Or rather than don't do that, um, if you do that, this could occur, then he still had choice. So smart. Yeah. You know, and he began to realize that, but also not just seeing him as this kid to the best of my ability, seeing him as a being and also recognizing that he has some desires that he came here to be and, you know, and nurturing that for him. 
So if you see a decision sort of calculating or if you know it's going to be a bad decision, do you let them make that to to realize the consequences and sort of that whole, uh, you know, this equals that in life? To a degree, yes. And then, you know, and then no also. Like go <laughs> with go with your awareness as a parent of when you actually need to step in. Right. Like one of the things was my son, he wanted to go to this school that basically they were doing drugs and, you know, and all these different things. And I knew it wasn't going to work out. And I just went, no, look, you're going to this boarding school. And he hated me for it, but I knew it was the choice I needed to make. And I had no idea why I just knew that I did. And so it's also the willingness to make those choices and recognize that it's, it's your job to, to get them closer to where they can actually create their future and also set them up so that they can, they can create a life. It's yeah. like at 12 years old, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily looking at your future. That's true. It's, it's all about the now, right? Yeah. I know I was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brendan, one of the greatest gifts in my recovery was, and I do believe that that recovery is a gift and I know that you do too. Oh, so we'll, cir too. we'll circle back to that. But yeah. the, one of the greatest gifts in my sobriety is the ability to be able to rebuild relationships that perhaps I had fractured in, in active addiction. And, uh, I tell this story often, but one of the sort of milestones in, in my sobriety was my sister and brother-in-law going on vacation and asking me to house sit. And I realized that that trust had been restored uh, wow. from when I had destroyed it, you know, during my alcohol, active alcoholism. How have you realized in different relationships that the trust has been rebuilt or that the ability to rebuild those relationships is one of the most beautiful parts of recovery? that one's taken a lot of patience you know in the beginning few months it was like because i'm a, i'm coming up on 16 months now you know this time and the beginning few months of it it was like it was still that that attitude of when's it going to happen when's it going to happen like yeah still that you know that the the attitude you have as an alcoholic which is basically every instant gratification right now 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 now, now. and how's it going to show up and when am i going to get my and, piece and, and me, blah, me, blah. me me and me 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 <laughs> me 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 you know and first of all i would say for me one of the hardest and most challenging thing was things was accepting that i chose it because you know i wanted to be like oh it's a disease and you know and and there is all of that there is all of that too but it was when i i had to really look at wow i actually did hurt these people you know i actually did lie to these people i actually did um you know go against and destroy these relationships and it was that was a hard pill to swallow it, it really was and so now i would say i'm still rebuilding them you know every day is is a rebuilding of that of that trust and i realized yesterday with dealing with some stuff with my business i realized that a lot of people in my business are waiting for me to basically relapse again you know so there's still that energy there of oh is he okay you know mm -hmm. or is he going to fall off the wagon so another thing that i had to get begin to get really clear on was what my point of view was and what I was aware of in other people. Cause I remember like there'd be many times where it'd be like just a lot of energy coming at me. Like I've got a lot of people around the world that know me. Yeah. So a lot of energy of, Oh, I wonder if he's going to drink again. So what I do with that is basically I have a reminder every day just to basically kind of like let go of all of the, other people's projections, expectations, separations, judgments, rejections, all that stuff that other people have on me and not buy that as my own also. Yeah, because that's a lot of pressure if, if you try yeah. to, to think about that. And I think expectations on ourselves or other people or things we can't control yeah. is too much to think about. So uh, I, I like that uh, viewpoint. Well, that's why I love the, um, I did a lot of AA this time around. 
you know, I used it. I went to, I, th I think I went to, it was like 150 meetings or something in four months. Wow. You know, I just went for it because I knew that my life was over this time. If I couldn't get, if I couldn't lay that platform in the beginning and, you know, the serenity prayer was great because it was, it basically speaks to all that. Give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Mm. Yeah. As an alcoholic, you do not want to do that. It's <laughs> accept the things I cannot change. No, I'm going to change them anyway. Right. Right. You know, so it was, you know, and then, and then the courage to change the things that I can. So to recognize the things in me that I could change so that I could actually begin to create a different life. And then the wisdom to know the difference, which is the big part of knowing where you're kind of lying to yourself going, yeah, I can change this, but really you've, it's more about being in acceptance or being in allowance of it. The, the rooms uh, of AA saved my life and yeah. forever grateful to that program. I will say as my recovery sort of evolves, you know, I, I add different things to, to, you know, my, my repertoire. And I think the online recovery community has been an enormous part of that recently. How has the sort of community aspect of things helped you this time around? Well, it's like, like I said, I went, I did a lot in the beginning and lately I haven't really been doing much at all. And, you know, apart from just my stuff that I do, you know, with access consciousness in, in growing as, as me also, and constantly looking at, okay, so where else would I like to, what else would I like to choose? How can I be more of who I actually am? But I was actually, I just got home from a trip. I was in uh, Brazil and then Colombia. And when I was down in Brazil, this old energy started coming up in my world. Basically the energy where it would have been like, you know, screw the world, I'm drinking. Mm. And so I was, I instantaneously went, wow, what am I doing? I actually have kind of stepped out a little bit of the whole talking with other alcoholics and going to AA meetings and doing stuff like that. And I realized while I was down there, I went, wow, I've actually lived my life a lot like that. I'd wait until things got bad. You know, things got bad enough to make a change rather than live the change. And I, so I went, you know what, that's it. As soon as I get home, I'm going back to meetings and I'm going to start being more, much more present with that because that's the other thing that I didn't realize the last time around when I, when I went to get sober was how quickly it can come and get you. Oh yes. That's a lot like step 10 and 11, right? Yeah. Living yeah. in the change, living in this sort of better version of ourselves. So we don't have to apologize so we don't have to go back and and make changes i know right isn't that yeah. such a gift though when you can wake up every uh, day and go oh i didn't rule my life yesterday <laughs> it's beautiful it's the best thing <laughs> yeah totally i agree i agree and especially having conversations what i love is having conversations with people knowing i'm not lying to them yeah oh it's so it's so relieving it's like this yeah. weight off of your shoulders just to be you and speak the truth and live the truth it's beautiful yeah it is beautiful and you know the other thing is like i like who i am now yes i don't know if i've ever been able to say that before like truly say it that i like who i am and i like myself more each day i love that well that's a great segue my next question was brendan are you happy and it sounds like you are and, and it you're you're projecting happiness yeah well you know what in total honesty, it's taken me, this is recent that I've really started to, that that started to be a, a sustainable thing where it's like where I have a lot more sense of who I am and I have a lot more sense of what's true for me, you know? And I also have, a. Th I think this is the biggest part is I have a lot more honesty with myself. Mm -hmm. So I know when I'm bullshitting myself yes. <laughs> far quicker now than any time yeah. in the past where it's like, wait a minute, you know, I'm doing expectation of another person. I know that's only going to create separation. Mm. So it's like, so I go, okay, wait a, who am I being right now? Which is a great question. I find when I'm, when I'm kind of acting out or, you know, I'm in judgment or I'm just kind of being a dick. Yeah. <laughs> is, is 
who am I being right now? You know, and you might get, oh, I'm being my mother or I'm being my father or I'm being someone else. You know what? This is not being me. What would my point of view be here if I was truly having my point of view? Yeah, there was this, for me, this level of delusion back then when I yeah. would believe my own bullshit and yeah. kind of live my own bullshit in a way to make others believe it. And I don't, I don't buy my own bullshit anymore, which I think I was a big... That. A big switch for me yeah and that isn't that interesting that that's it seemed for me anyway to be one of the hardest nuts to crack <laughs> yes it was like but if i give that up then everyone's gonna know and i'm like everyone already knows they already know right they already they already <laughs> know you're full of shit and, right. and it's like you know i have i had a huge like i remember with you know i was facilitating big, big classes with access consciousness right and we sent an email out to 600,000 people saying Brennan's getting help. He's had a problem with alcohol his whole life. And so that was like 600,000, like wow. this was like, oh my, you know, and it was like, dude, what do you, what image, <laughs> what image of you are you unwilling to let go of? You know, so that first few months was really about, it was strong talks with myself. You know, it was really having to look directly at me and go, okay, what do you actually desire here? Do you want to live as something that other people can accept? Or do you want to be something that can create, you know, a different, a different life, but also a different world? Brendan, we have a lot of listeners who are in early recovery. Uh -huh. uh, what are some actionable items that they can some steps they could take today if they are still struggling? Oh, man, good question. First of all, I would say never give in, never give up and never quit. Also, don't isolate yourself. That is dangerous in the first, first steps. This was a tough one for me because I'm really good at isolating myself. And I actually have created a life where I get a lot of space for me. So I had to get out of that and I had to go to meetings, you know, and I forced myself go to meetings. I forced myself to get on the phone, talk to other alcoholics, because the other thing is, is someone who hasn't been an alcoholic doesn't know what it is to be an alcoholic. So and, true. you know, so I had to talk to people. I'd be like, wow, you did that too. You know, like, wow, like you, you know, you destroyed your life like that too. Like you didn't, <laughs> you blacked out for, you know, days at a time too. <laughs> So it was it was talking to people like that. I read a lot. You know, I kept myself busy. I, I went to the gym a lot. I worked out a lot. I basically for the first four months, I set my house up as my own rehab center. It was just mm. to the best of my ability. And this is the thing I found hardest was learning what kindness for me was. That's the last thing you want to do is be kind to you when you realize what you've destroyed. Oh, yeah my own toughest critic and I, and I will beat myself down for it too. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's like, I, I did love the AA's approach with one day at a time. Yeah. You know, you've got today deal with today, especially in those early stages you got today. So what are you going to choose today? That's going to create something different for you. And just to the best of your ability, relax relax and trust the process and trust yourself and just know that if you keep going it will change honestly nate even 12 13 months ago when i was say three months into sobriety i still i was like this is never going to change you know i did not have a i did not i did not have a very um a very nice visual of my future but i just kept going i never gave in Brendan, tell folks where they can find you online if they are interested in working together or want to learn more about your message. You can find me at my website, brendanwatt.com. And I would highly suggest checking out Access Consciousness. We got a lot of free videos on YouTube and and everywhere. There's a there's like 10,000 people who facilitate this bars that I talked about, the Access yeah. Bars. And we've got like a thousand other certified facilitators around the world. There's a lot of people doing it. And it's just, see, for me, AA, epic at getting me sober and keeping me there. Yep. Access, phenomenal for me in creating my life 
And that was, so the two of them together was I can have sobriety and actually create the future that I'd like to have in existence. The future that that six-year-old could see, which is wow. weird, right? Yeah. Because you go, well, what does a six-year-old know? That six-year-old knew he came here to be something different in the world. You know, it was just all of the, see, we learn about judgment. As soon as we learn about judgment, we basically learn how to give up us. Hmm. That's another thing that I couldn't see as a possibility 12 months ago was that I'd ever get out of judgment of myself. And that's taken some work. That's really taken some work and getting present with it and recognizing that you can. Each and every one of us can create a phenomenal life. And I like to see myself as a pretty good example of that beginning to show up again. Yeah, we. I think we get programmed at such a young age to take on this perception of someone else's version of ourselves. Yeah, and I think definitely. once we shed that and live in our reality and, and live our own truth, I think is when we can kind of start putting one foot in front of the other. Totally, that part. And, you know, I had a um, Gary Douglas who I talked about before. He said to me a couple of years ago, he said, when I was really struggling, like with trying not to drink, but also wanting to drink, not wanting to get help, not wanting to look at it, you know, and he said to me, one of the things he said that always stuck with me was he said, if you start living what's true for you, your life will take off in ways that you cannot imagine. And at that point, I couldn't hear it. And now I can. And I know anytime I choose that, which matches, which lights, which makes me lighter. Mm -hmm. Anytime I choose that, my life expands in ways that I cannot imagine. And that's pretty hard to do as an, as an active alcoholic. Right. So it's like, you know, that part of coming in and getting programmed is, I mean, for how many of us did, did we come here to make somebody happy? Our parents, you know, somebody in our life happy. So we've already set ourselves up to be a failure because I'm, I know for me, I'm the only one that can choose happiness. No one can make me happy. Very powerful. Well said, my friend. I will link everything in today's show notes, Access Consciousness and brendanwatt.com. Brendan, such a great conversation. Thank you so much thank for your you, time mate. today, my friend. I'm really grateful. And thank you for everything that you're doing. It's epic, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank we'll you. talk soon. Keep in touch. Bye, my friend. Thanks so much for listening today, friend. Hopefully you heard something that resonates with you. And if we help just one person, our job is done. Make sure you check today's show notes for all the information discussed in today's episode and how to connect with our guests. Until next Wednesday, try your best not to drink and be good to yourself. Bye, everyone.